Welcome to the Poetry Hood podcast. On this recording, my guest is Farah Shamma, who is a Palestinian international writer and performer. She took the Arab world by storm through her poetry performance videos, some of which have went viral. She currently performs in shows around the world and has numerous writing projects. Farah is also a personal friend of mine who worked with me hand in hand in growing the Poetry Hood back in 2017, co-hosting some of our events and moderating many of our workshops. I really enjoyed this conversation with Farah and I hope you do too. So without further ado, Farah Shamma. How to always be nice. Make sure to stare into walls. A lot of them. Look up if you may. Look away. Some faces only bring out the ugly in you. So look away. Sadness is more gentle than anger. And the world is no piñata. Sweet things do not come after a good beating. Let your eyes speak for you. You are kinder than all this, and slowly you will learn how to laugh at everything. Turn bad incidents into stories you tell your loved ones, and you laugh until it's too good to be ugly. You know, I wanted to tell you something. Uh, like going into this podcast recording, I thought of this one lesson that I learned from you at the beginning when we were both working on the poetry hood and, uh, you know, fixing up these workshops together. Mm. You said, like, you brought the awareness to me that there are some poems that are good for the page and others that are good for the stage. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, like, recently, where do you find yourself more on the page or on the stage? And why? I think I've recently discovered that what I consider to be poetry for the page can actually be sung on the stage. So poetry that I consider to be more beautiful, read. I've recently discovered that after meeting a, a singer, songwriter, I shared this I shared some of my written pieces with her and she uh, she sang them. And that was one of the most beautiful things I've witnessed to see something I've written that I thought, ah, it's not really performable for me, but for a singer, it really is performable because mm. yeah, she was able to tlahenhum <laughs> in her own way to, um, to find a rhythm and to uh, to find the right music for them. So you would say that poems that are for reading can be turned into like any poem? I think it depends. I think I'm, I had a poetry night in London where I felt I wanted to share everything I've been writing. And I felt that the audience was in that mindset to listen. It was a long day. There were a lot of conferences and events during the day. So I felt that the audience was somewhat tired I, it was just a, a, a spur of the moment uh, decision. So I looked at them and I said, you know what? I changed my whole plan for today. And I just sat on the stage. Uh, the lights were dimmed. I asked the person responsible for light to, you know, switch the lights on. And we just sat. Um, we were a small group. So by then, a lot of people had left. So you guys like huddled together. Yeah, as somehow. If, like, as like Yeah, was of it. So we just sat around and I started reading uh, my little notebook, which I had with me okay. uh, that day. So it really depends. I mean, sometimes an audience really wants a performance. Mm. They want that energy. And sometimes you feel like you're not in the mood for it. So I think it depends. And, and this has changed. But okay. definitely there are poems that are more enjoyable when seen on a page. Right. And others that are written in a way where they, they look more like a theater piece or, um, you know, or, or a monologue or a, something like that. Yeah, totally. I, I couldn't agree more. 
about that, which actually opened my eyes to like even the way that I write. Mm -hmm. I would like I would think of the things that I'm writing like, oh, yes, I w this sounds like a stage performance piece. So I'm going to write it that way. And it, I think it elevated the the delivery of it. Also, okay, so I want to ask you as well. So for this event that you were talking about in the poetry night, mm. you just decided on the spur of the moment. Yeah. Like, so you improvised. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's. I think that takes a lot of cor courage to just say, I'm going to do this experimental thing. Like, how do you feel when you're coming up with the idea? You know, you know what? I'm going to do this now while you're on stage. What's your I thought think, process? Yeah, I understand the question very well. I think, you know, a space imposes um, a certain feeling. Sometimes we prepare for something. We imagine it a certain way in our heads. And then we get to the space, we take a quick look at the audience and we feel something. And this intuitive feeling is very important to me because sometimes I feel, okay, um, it's like meeting someone sitting on a table and uh -huh. feeling like, okay, I need to crack a joke now. You don't really decide. It's not really a decision. It's just this impulsive and intuitive action mm. that just feels right. And then there's another show I had in London where I knew we had to prepare. It was a long set. Um, the venue, because I had been to the venue, it was a concert venue. It was mainly people are used to, you know, seeing music, you know, attending a music concert. And I was playing with musicians, so we did have to have some sort of a plan mm. that we could decide to break together. But that was more organized. And I couldn't just go like, okay, I would like to now share all my intimate, you know, it didn't, yeah, feel, of course. It didn't feel right. But I think it's, the more we understand performance and the stage as, as, a, as a conversation, I mean, that's what makes me very comfortable. I feel like mm. it is a conversation with a collective, with a group of people. And at the end of the day, I would like to connect with the audience in a way or another. So to me, it is a conversation. And that's why there is space for change and for quick decisions and for, mm. you know, what you said is more courageous. To me, it's, I think, if you're like that on stage, you would also be like that in, in real life. In real life. Exactly. That w in which case, you're proving your authenticity on the stage as well. Yeah. Because you wouldn't do that unless you were being completely authentic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like going into a, um, a, you know, a job interview <laughs> and preparing for it and having bullet points. But then you arrive there and you meet the people interviewing you and you feel like the <laughs> whole mood is different and... There is space for, you know, a joke or changing the, the script yeah. somehow and then sharing a story. It depends. Exactly. I mean, it's always good to have a plan, mm -hmm. but then it's always good to understand that, yeah, we are not machines and we don't press a play button and then, <laughs> you know. And then turn robot yeah, on. Yeah, and then just go like, okay. Yeah. So recently you've been, uh, you've uh, successfully completed a was it a gofundme campaign no it was um indiegogo indiegogo yeah shout out to indiegogo yeah <laughs> yeah they're good they're nice they give me money <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you you successfully got an indiegogo campaign running and you which took you to goldsmiths yeah goldsmiths goldsmiths oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so tell us about your experience over there. I don't know where you, where are you right now with all of that and how was it? I did the Indiegogo campaign to collect the university fees for a master's, for a master's in performance and culture. Uh, so it is in the theater department and it's, um, it's what I discovered to be a very academic masters about performance and the place of performance in society how is it perceived what does it mean uh, who is the audience um, what social class is the audience so this is what my master's was and yeah i wrote my my main research was about um, theater in syria and censorship and a specific group i focused on one group called the kun theater group which are now 
uh, which is a group based in Beirut, currently run by Osama Halal. Uh, so it's understanding the place of theater in society uh, and performance and how sometimes uh, theater and performance defy power, the state, like mm -hmm. in Syria, how sometimes they go hand in hand and so on. So it was a very theoretical MA. I think I needed it because um, it was very grounding uh, and yeah, I finished. I just got my grades last week and I, um, I'm done with my master's. Uh, I'm still based in London for the next couple of months. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming you passed with flying colors. <laughs> I passed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shattered. <laughs> no, I, I, did, I did pass. Um, I, did, I did quite well, which is, which is very nice because I wrote about something that, uh, that means a lot to me. Uh, I right. didn't know, but I discovered that um, I have a connection to Syria, uh, somehow to Syrian theater, to the story of uh, how theater... I mean, when we speak about theater in St Syria, we always go back to the Ottoman Empire, to a man called Abu Khalil al-Qabbani, mm -hmm. who had a theater and it was burnt down, um, so on. And it's, it, it, it starts with the story of defiance, that there is a clash and it's it's really about understanding why is there a clash? How does performance uh, challenge uh, this the status quo somehow? Okay, uh, so your research paper was uh, specifically about sorry I forgot the name of the group. Kuhn. Kuhn. Yes. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Kuhn? Kuhn? Yeah. Kuhn Theater Group. Sounds interesting. It's a beautiful theater group based in Beirut. They have a theater called Kuhn. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Beirut, I would definitely recommend that you check them out, see if they have any performances. Uh, they have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they also have contemporary dance classes and um, they have ongoing plays okay. happening. They collaborated with Sima Dance Company at one point, Sima oh, Dance yeah. Company who are based in Dubai. Yeah, uh, yeah. But at some point they were based in Beirut and they had a collaboration. They had a show called Cellophane, okay. Cellophane or Cellophane. Yeah. And uh, their work is on YouTube. And it's interesting because they started in Damascus. Uh, Kun Theater Group started in Damascus. And there was some sort of a clash, especially after 2011, after the Syrian uprising. When you say clash, do you mean like they would create theater pieces that are sp putting out a political message against one or another? I mean, somehow powerhouse. I mean, what's very beautiful about Kuhn Theater Group's work is that it's very subtle. It can be interpreted in many ways. And Osama Halal, the director, always intends for that to be the case. Yeah. And it's polemic because when you have a work that can provoke and can make people ask questions, a lot of interpretations um, are born. And to a state like, you know, the, the Syrian state that yeah, is... Which is complex in of its own. Yeah, yeah. Itself, yeah. Because there is, there is a very, I mean, we all have heard of Gawar al of, uh, you know, Al-Masrahiyat, Kasak Ya Watan, Gurbe, Hadol Masrahiyat Suriya. There are some very famous also like political Syrian plays that are very applauded and very allowed in Syria. And the Arab world is known for these plays, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it was a very big uh, topic, you know. It made me look at the history of Arab theater somehow and performance. And of course, when we say theater, performance is never separate from theater. Performance is part of theater or some people see that theater is part of performance. So performance is the big umbrella. Okay. Uh, and then theater comes under it. So, so what do you mean when you say performance then? So performance is any type of performance. We can understand performance to be, I mean, socially, it's how we perform, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in life every day. When you go to, jo to your work, you are performing a certain role. Yeah. And then imagine when you have such a broad definition of a performance, so any type of show you attend, whether it's dance or stand-up comedy or, um, you know, a circus mm. um, or a play or even, then you understand even a film is a performance. So you start seeing performance as the act, the social act, the political act, any act 
yeah. becomes a performance. It's the content, I, yeah. would assu- I would say. Yeah, it is the content and it's the presence of an audience. Oh. Even when I tell you when you go to your job and you perform a certain way, you have someone watching you. Yeah. Um, you have this validation. Mm. Uh, and yeah, and then you start understanding, okay, then that's one broad definition. And then I want to lower it down to a physical space. Where do people perform? Theater. Theaters, but in our case, in the poetry hood cafes. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, so theater is more like the environment setup of the performance. It depends. Yeah. So you can either call theater as any place with a stage or a theater which is the actual building yeah and with this is curta- actually with the red curtains exactly with the red <laughs> curtains and a specific seat and it's more classical yeah. and Osama Halal for example one of his main goals was to challenge the idea that theater is only Il Masrah the place Biruha Al Masrah it's sometimes even considered to be a little posh, you know, like you can imagine people with, you know, fancy dresses and, and uh, wearing you know. a papillon. Yeah. yeah, something like that. <laughs> but Osama Halal started off performing in the street. OK. Uh, Site specific performances, they're called. Um, oh, so I like that. Al Masrah al So in Tab al on the spot, in the street. And he said, my main goal was to attract passerbys, people who do not intend to go to the theater, people who do not have the knowledge or the money to buy a ticket. He said, the main goal was to introduce theater as an art form and not as a physical space. Mm-hmm. So in a way, it is. Because it, in a way, you're limited to just masrah. And there exactly. are so many. Uh, Props also that you can use for your performance. Exactly. Are like outside the masrah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then you start to think, you know, when you have a little gathering, mm. and then you have this one person who is like a, the storyteller. I have an uncle, for example. As soon as he yeah. opens his mouth. Do- doesn't every Arab Yeah, every Arab guy. family probably <laughs> yeah. has an uncle who just sits down. And doesn't shut up. And like everyone wants to listen. Everybody's yeah. listening. <laughs> to me, that is, you know, site-specific performance. It is, you start seeing that it's the most natural thing. And therefore, it helps you go up on stage and just be that. And just understand that I do not have to put any effort to be something else because it's already happening everywhere and you start observing everybody do a certain thing. And the more observant you are, the more you realize, even of yourself, you say, but that's where I'm funny or that's where I'm very smart or that's where I'm very whatever. You start observing yourself, speaking to friends or, or whatever, and then you understand that Performance is not just when I memorize a text and I go up on stage and I speak it perfectly. Yeah, just blurt it out. Yeah, Yeah. that's not what it is. It's really about how I socially interact with an audience, which I do every single day. And we mostly all do, except, you know. I guess some people then are able to open themselves up on the stage in front of an audience that they don't know. (laughs) And just be themselves. I guess that's where the saying comes like, be, oh, just go out there and be yourself on stage. Yeah, yeah. Everyone says <laughs> it. Everyone says it's that. No one knows what, it's, uh, what it actually yeah. means and how I to mean, pull it off. It's very easy to say. And I think we all perform certain roles and we can be pretentious. And, you know, sometimes when I when I speak and then I suddenly have a British word coming out of my <laughs> mouth because I feel like I'm in a more serious context. Um, whatever, we all speak a certain way, think a certain way in certain contexts and we perform a certain role. And I think the more we do, the more we go up on stage, the more we become aware of how we change and, or how we don't. And we can start playing with that uh, and we can start pointing it out you know, mm. to the audience and say, look at me being all, you know, <laughs> whatever. And, and then there, there's something that becomes very natural um, about going up there, mocking yourself, uh, mocking the, 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 you know, the very serious kind of context. And right. it depends on what you want to do. And you can, of course, do it the, you know, the professional way and go up there and say, good evening, I would like to read you a poem about uh, the time when my mother, you know, uh, traveled to the States and left me for 12 months alone, whatever. And you can do it in a very organized way where you introduce the poem, say the poem, receive applause, and you did your thing That's and it. it's filmed and then you share it. Mm. You can do it like that. Or you can just go up there and and just feel whatever, you know, and yeah. change the poem. 
it's also it would be like an experience for you it's a self discovering experience for you for yourself as well uh i would say like from my personal uh perspective there was this event we once had i think we were co-hosting it yeah. as well uh where i performed this poem about dating yeah i remember <laughs> and man there's this one part of the poem where i was talking about it's it's really stupid it's so <laughs> silly <laughs> but i said something about the food and uh, looking at her and yeah. i was like eat love eat love and then i like mixed it up and i said love eat on like love to the food but oh, eat to her and i yeah. was like oh shit like yeah. i fucked up the date yeah i I saw, like, I looked out and I saw everyone laughing. And that felt so, like, oh, yeah, that it was supposed to be funny. Yeah. yeah that's great. Like, and you didn't even know. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't even know exactly. But that was just, like, me being myself. It's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I, w- I just want to say it. Like, I think it's good. And I want to say it. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who, who I met in London who stutters uh-huh. when she speaks. And she's a performer. Okay. And she uses that. And I love that. That's amazing. She doesn't hide her stutters. Yeah. She uses that on stage and points it out. Mm-hmm. And I think it's always good to point out your fears, whether you do it um, on stage. And I think that's also like very good relationship advice. <laughs> 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 so like... <laughs> this is turning into a relationship therapy yes. session. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a therapy hotline <laughs> for the brokenhearted. Please call. Yeah. The poetry hood. Al Hay Al Shari. Al Hay Al Shari. Well, Lil Mashair, I don't. Yeah. 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 خلينا نكون زي طيورك على الشجر نغني أول ما يطلع الفجر خلينا زي المي والنار والهوى خلينا هيك سوا ما بدنا نتعلم دروس وما بدنا نشوف كابوس عشان نعرف طعم الحلم خلينا نحن الحلم من خاف من الحرب فخلينا نحن السلم خلينا هيك سوا خلينا أجمل من حالنا لحالنا مهما كبرنا من ضل ولاد صغار خلينا أكبر من اللي صار خلينا نطير ونصير زي القمر غيمة نجمة موجة في البحر غصن خجول بميل مع المطر شباك صغير بيطل على السحر خلينا هيك مهما كبرنا من ضل نخاف من العتم اللي جواتنا خلينا هيك خلينا إحنا النور ثابتين لو الأرض بتدور آمين uh, We were once having a conversation between you, I and uh, our very good friend Ala yeah. and uh, we were talking about colloquial Arabic والعرب الفصحى yeah. yeah. And how, like, we were having the discussion of should we be writing in colloquial Arabic mm. slash performing mm. in colloquial Arabic? Mm. And would this be reviving Arabic or is it killing Arabic? Because on one side, I guess from my my point of view is that, yes, maybe we are killing the mm. Arab Fosha, mm. but does that mean we're killing Arabic in general? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to dive into that discussion because i find it very interesting yeah i think it's i mean for arabic speaking audiences um even for people learning arabic i think it's important to understand well this is one thing i would like to look into more and research the origins of the arabic language i still don't have enough information i still didn't do my research Mm. uh, but where was Fusha born as a language? And Al-Ammiyat, the, the you know, um, spoken dialects in the Arab world mm. in 22 Arab countries, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Very different accents. Which, which ones came first? And did Fusha become the, the uniting Arabic language through Islam and the Quran? 
or was it spreading before? Mm. So these are questions I am still asking myself and I would, I would like to, um, now that I do this, write a paper about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, but I think it's an important question to, to start diving into this with more precision uh, because I am still unsure about, okay, uh, what's the place of Arabic nowadays in a world where English is the language, the common language in many, many, many countries? It's the language of, uh, you know, education, of Netflix, <laughs> of, uh, you know, it's, um, it's massive. You of know, podcasts. It's of podcasts. Here yeah. we are today because we know that when we speak English, we will um, reach, yeah, a, reach like, a, a wider yeah. audience yes. because Europe, you know, mm. with their... Uh, you know, indiv individual countries have their languages, but there's English uniting well. most of them, yeah. and it's everywhere. Uh, and then, yeah, and it's a big question. Language is one of the biggest questions we can ask ourselves because of colonialism, mm. uh, why we speak English, why we speak French, uh, why do we study, you know, as, you know, as Arabs or... Um, so, yes, but, I mean, without having these answers yet, I can still say when we feel that, okay, there's a language that is uh, dying out for different reasons. I think even you and I, when we're not doing this podcast, we speak more English, Yeah. Uh, right? We, we're both Palestinians, uh, born and raised in Dubai, and we find ourselves more comfortable speaking English. Yeah, I'll take the blunt of that one, though. Like, yeah, but... So uh, my Arabic is a bit weaker. But than, I do that yeah. with, with my sister sometimes. I mean, I don't do okay. that with my mother, but mm. I realize that anyone born in the, you know, 20th century, 21st century, mainly, you know, in the late 20th century, of course, prefers speaking English. English. Mm. Why? Is it Dubai? Is it how? But I go to Jordan and I see the same thing. It's, it's cooler mm. to speak English. I also, let's look at spoken word poetry. I know many spoken word artists who are Arabic speakers, yet who do not write in Arabic. Why? And it's, it's becoming more of a question, not really... I sometimes get angry, like, خلاص احكو عربي, like, speak Arabic, for, for, for God's sake, you know, just, mm. just speak Arabic. But then I'm like, okay, no, it's not really about that, it's about understanding what's going on. Yeah, the evolution to our current state, Yeah. as well as, like, what can you do from your end? What can mm. you do? And I think there's an inferiority complex, because... I mean, when I was in school and we, we had Arabic class, it was just a little more boring. We have to say yeah. it like that. Yeah. It was not taught in a way that is interactive, that is fun. Fusha being a language that is not spoken, you know, casually at home. You don't No one speaks Fusha to their parents. I, yeah. um, no one I know of, at least from the Levant or speaks you know speaks fusha so it is a it's like shakespearean english yeah totally i guess you don't hear people speaking english that way either no you know when yeah we don't but i of course i do because you know i studied in the uk <laughs> and i will say thou yeah but it, there you go but you know what i mean it, so you start understanding it as a phenomenon okay why is this happening uh, and what do i want to do about it and why mm -hmm. well i think i am one of those now that feels that I would like to write in any language that I feel like writing in. In uh, any dialect? Maybe? In any dialect as well, yeah. like Ammiye. I even refuse slowly to call it Ammiye. So Ammiye comes from the word Amme. So it's like the general, general the mass. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the language of the masses. And somehow it, is, it makes it look inferior. It's the language of the street. Uh -huh. And Fusha is the language of the elite. The correct. The correct language. Yeah. But that's not true. I think if we go back, and that's why going back to the history of Arabic and understanding the relationships between the dialects and Fusha and how Fusha United um, became the united language, the Arabic. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, there's also the same discussion between is British English English, <laughs> the true English, yeah. or is it American English? Right. And it's that, it's the English or the Arabic. And I believe that language should be more of a tool, mm. not an objective. Absolutely. I, yeah. I agree with that as well. Uh, that's a very interesting question that you actually put out because it's true. I, I myself don't know if Arabi Fusha 
was the first thing, like the thing that everyone was speaking. Yeah. And then it developed into dialects. No, no, I mean, I'm, how could there not be dialects back then? Yeah, there were. And yeah. I mean, I'm not going to share my limited knowledge because I, it's really right. limited. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I know for a fact that Ammiyat were, were, were there. Okay. Before. Oh, so you do know that. Yeah. Okay. But I, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to, uh, you know, just say any, anything, but I just think if you are a defender of Fusha, you should know why you're a defender of Fusha. And I think it's important for us as Arabic speakers to understand the history because we are very defensive. Mm. <laughs> a lot of Arabic speakers, when they see a weak Arabic on the internet, what they claim to be weak, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. really criticize it they're brutal and it's not constructive it's very brutal it's mm. like روحي تعلمي عربي you know go learn Arabic properly then start writing poetry in it and because poetry has a very high place because mm. of uh, even al-jahiliya you know right. there was the muallaqat there was this poetry competition that took place um, which are all very commendable but yeah also yeah I, th I feel like there's a, a lot of fear from evolution like we don't want to evolve our language into other things of course because it's holy right there yes you go. so this is uh, where the uh, question uh. becomes okay we want to preserve and make sure a language is safe uh, and but at the same time we don't want to put it in a museum to make sure it's safe and then not use it exactly and, and that's exactly what's happening of, of course and that's what's happening and that's why i am one of the you know the people that would love to write more arabic would love to uh, do work in that because i see that it's being it's it's becoming elitist only a few people feel like they own the language they speak the language it's the academics and then you have this youth <laughs> yeah. who just are confused uh, because English is the thing now. Mm -hmm. uh, we all feel a little American on the inside. We don't know why. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I it's think... Like goddamn Facebook and YouTube, man. <laughs> but I mean everything. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, if you want the sophisticated term, it's called cultural imperialism. It's when one culture wins and it's fine and it happens. Yeah. But then we cannot just sit there and be confused at who we are mm. and start defending our Arabness or whatever without really knowing what's happening. But yeah, and that's mainly why. So I've been writing in Ammiye, uh, okay, in Al Arabi Al Mahki. That's what I started calling it. So spoken Arabic. And I love that because that's what I speak to my parents. That's my uh, Palestinian identity because I have, I speak you know, a Palestinian dialect. And I also speak, my dad was born and raised in Syria. So part, a big part of his family speaks Syrian. And I love playing with that, mm -hmm. uh, with these two dialects. And it's very rich to already play with two dialects and treat them like two languages. They are the same language, but it's also good to see how rich they are and play with them and, and use them. Yeah, and I mean, from the perspective of the stage as well, it actually adds to your authenticity as a performance uh, because if that's the language that you speak every yeah. day, then that's the language that you're doing on stage. Then that, that means that's more of you rather than anything else, which is like suddenly you switch to Fusha and it's like, yeah. yo, I don't even know who's that person on stage. Of course, and Fusha is, I am trying to work out my relationship with Fusha still. Mm. I am not sure how I feel about it because as you said it's the it's not the language I speak so when I use it why do I use it and for what for what purpose but yeah so it all depends on on the work you want to do because I've you know when I write Fusha I mean at least from the YouTube comments and the comments I receive I receive a lot of criticism mm. Like, your language is not strong enough. Uh, so it depends. And like, would it always be like real or would it be sometimes like you were just trying to play with the words and you're trying to mix things up? I mean, when I write Fusha, I think I don't play. <laughs> okay. And that's the problem because we don't feel... I don't feel that I have the 
language capacity to play and make puns and because I am not as exposed to fusha. I mean, I did my master's in English. So I read so many books in English, wrote a huge paper in English. I cannot even imagine doing the same thing in Arabic, fusha. Imagine doing your bachelor's in fusha. Mm, I can't, It's, personally. Yeah, <laughs> and there you go. And this is our dilemma. We, cannot, we do not think structured thoughts in fusha because we do not receive the education. And if we want to do, do it individually, yeah, sure. But that's a lot of work. Yeah. And yeah, and personally, I feel I would love to, <laughs> you know, go on this endeavor of um, learning fusha academically uh, and finding an advanced class, not a, you know, not a beginner's fusha class, but an advanced class uh, of fusha. Yeah, um, my personal experience with Arabic is that back in the day, I used to think in my head in Arabic, mm. like. I don't know, ever since I had my first thought. Yeah. Until maybe I would say grade, I don't know, like 10 mm. or something like that. Mm. In my head, I'd be like, Jamil, go to the Gurfa of the Aadeh. Yeah, yeah. Let's watch the television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, things like that. One day, I think I woke up and I was like, oh, Jamil, get up and go make yourself a sandwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, hold up a second. But did you realize that on the spot? No, not on the spot. Yeah. But like throughout time, yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. slowly changing. Yeah. And I think at one moment, it was just like, yo, I speak to myself in English now. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. So that's very interesting. And I think like I know why that's happening is because at the time, I had a group of friends who were all Arab speakers. Yeah. And we'd speak to each other in Arabic. Yeah. And then throughout school, you know, friends, friendships are changing. I'm joining a new group of friends. And this new group of friends, all English speakers. Yeah. And I think I just, like, English got integrated so much that I started speaking in English in yeah, my head. Yeah, but I think it's, it's to this day. the movies, the songs, the... I mean, there is more cultural content in English. There is, yeah, definitely. And there you go. Yeah. The, the good bands, the good films. Yeah. If you think. Oh, funny it. enough, you mentioned that. That was around the same time where I started getting really into uh, music. Yeah. I, I really didn't care much about music up until like grade seven, eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I there started you go. listening to all these punk rock bands. Of or course. And definitely not Arabic. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's why I, I say one of my goals is to create Arabic content, hmm. you know cultural content, music, theater, poetry, literature, children's books, everything. Oh. Because we have a lack. We, we are obviously uh, it, we less exposed to Arabic, yeah. uh, sitcoms, so on. And I think people are aware of that. Um, I mean, at the beginning, you're really exposed to Arabic cartoons. Yeah. Like Al Muhaqqa, exactly. Conan, yeah, yeah. Captain Space Majid. Toon, yani. I think Space Two. <laughs> Grandizer. <laughs> yeah. These dubbed cartoons did yeah. a great job. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yo, And that's actually a very good point. These yeah. dubbed cartoons are what is holding Arabic yeah. <laughs> together. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a very, yeah, it's a string, really. It's yeah. not a very uh, <laughs> solid ground to hold. Back in the day when your mother or like your father is like telling you, stop watching cartoons. It's like, oh, you're killing the language. Yeah, you're huh? killing Arabic. Arupti. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it's... Um, oh, how ironic. ربما لأنني أحب العبور سريعا أحب أحضان الغرباء الذين قد لا أراهم إلا في صدفة قادمة أو قد لا أراهم أبدا ربما لأنني أحب صباح الخير وابتسامة دون الدخول في تفاصيل النهار وأحب البكاء عند رؤية طفلة تضع ما تبقى من غذائها في عبوتها الوردية وكتابة خاطرة عنها على طرف ورقة سأنساها في مكان ما ربما لأنني أفضل خطفات الوسن على النوم العميق والرؤى على الأحلام والفجر على الصباح والشموع على الكهرباء وكل من عليها فان على لتسكنوا إليها 
ربما لذلك I was wondering as an international poet mm. who by that definition I mean travels around the world performing yeah. rather than just performing in one place yeah I want to know how, like do you tweak a little bit your performances or yourself on stages uh, depending on which country you're in or are we getting the same exact farah that we'd see in mm. UAE or in where did you go is that a european country you went to norway was it no slovenia slovenia yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean uh, of course it depends on the show i don't always um, perform uh, spoken word poetry and i am definitely writing content now project by project for mm. Uh, whenever I'm invited somewhere, I, it's usually a project-based invitation. So what is written is immediately tweaked because it is written for a specific event. And that was also the case in Slovenia. Uh, but I think one of my... Let's say it was the same exact piece. Show, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, this takes us back to our initial conversation of I would feel the audience and then... Right. Uh, you know, say something, uh, make a remark that is particular to to this space and this place and this country uh, and crack a joke that would hopefully make the audience laugh mm. in that certain country. Uh, but I think I would like to, uh, this is one, uh, one thing I've been thinking about for the past year, it would also be good to have a show with a title and it would be like, the exact same show hmm. that would tour as in this show is coming to oh uh, okay there and it would be more of a of a just like how concerts do it like, like a one woman bands. show you know there's this beautiful one woman show oh my god it's fantastic i you, watched you it gotta twice you have to drop the name yeah of course <laughs> it's called jogging 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 and it's by a lebanese actress uh, called hanan el hajj and it tours. Uh, I watched it in London. It's currently touring in Lebanon. I cannot even describe how good this show is. It's a one-woman show. So yes, it's just her on stage taking you on a trip. Hmm. Social, political, religious. I mean, she takes you... It's, it's, it's very private. It's very personal. It's not on the internet. You have to be there. Oh, okay. You have to be there because she interacts with the audience she mm. makes you laugh and cry and scream. I mean, it was so good. I watched it twice and I uh, joined her workshop. I couldn't believe my eyes. I literally was blown, like completely. So yes, jogging, Hanan uh, al-Hajj. If you go to Beirut or, or, you know, just... She's mostly performing in Lebanon. It's, she also has a book of this one-woman show. Mm. And she's worked on it for 10 years, you know. It's not a... Wow, yeah. You it's can see it. You <laughs> can see that this has been... This is this has been her life. This yeah. show has been her whole life. She's been nurturing it to and, become what it and is. And it is what it is. And I'm sure it's changed over the years as she's performed it. And it changes. In London, she would make jokes about, you know, Boris Johnson. Or <laughs> she would, you know, she would, of course, adapt the... the, the because... She, it is a conversation. She looks at you in the eye and, and she comes close to the audience and whatever. But it is, there are subtitles, like surtitles, you know, on top. Uh -huh. And they're the same. They're, they're there, okay. you know. Like the, sh the script is there, but she doesn't make you feel like it's, it's a memorized script. You feel like she's thinking of all of this on the spot. Right. Well, if she's been setting it up for 10 years, oh. it'll, it'll become second nature. And oh then my God. the performance is second nature. She can focus on the interaction with the yeah, audience. Yeah, and it's, right? it's, it's, and seeing something like that, now that might be a big announcement uh, on the Poetry Hood uh, podcast, but makes short poetry, you know, poetry pieces feel like spoken word, I mean, yeah. just on the surface. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's just a little thing. It's whatever, four minutes, five minutes, and it's done, and it goes. And then there's another performer, and another one, another one. And I'm starting to feel like 
I would like to write something for 10 years <laughs> and then perform it because it's so deep mm. and it's something that you've put so much into uh, and that's something amazing to to it was so beautiful to experience and it really like it was a slap on the face and yeah that takes a lot of patience too it's well i remember there's a poet that performed at the poetry that she said this line <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I'm not sure, you know, I think everything has its beauty, but I think doing, I've been doing spoken word poetry since the age of 16. I'm 25 now. I think I'm bored. Mm. You know, I'm bored. I'm just bored of uh, the setup, uh, the. You know, the I, I started feeling like I started sounding the same. People started sounding the same. There's a certain intonation where we speak a certain way to deliver a poem. We think it has to be like that. And I feel like I definitely would like to get into theater. Mm. Uh, and when I say that, I mean full just blown. full no. blown a, a show, an mm. actual show where what's written takes its time and really grows but of course that doesn't mean that okay no no don't perform anymore no no, no i think start somewhere yeah. and and then you but you start understanding that things need to move things need to shift absolutely um and things need to you know as you grow older you feel like you know more parts of yourself and it's it's nice to document that shift and that can't really happen in one piece in a three minute or four minute piece yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Definitely. I've been doing the Poetry Hut for uh, approaching, I think, three years now. Mm. Uh, or no, I'm in the f I'm in the fourth year. Anyways, mm. uh, and we've done a bunch of events, like, mm. I don't know, maybe like 10, 12. Mm -hmm. And I've started feeling that, OK, we need to kick it up a notch. Yeah. I haven't done much on my part, to be honest, to kick it up a notch yet. Like focused on many other things like the podcast. Yeah. We're working on poetry films now. Mm. Uh, so definitely that's taking some time. But uh, when uh, he, my friend Yaz approached me to do this uh, flowetry event that I has, have been telling you about, yeah. that was really like a great breath of fresh air. Yeah. And when we were th thinking of the theme and how it will go, I told him, or we agreed that we wouldn't do it like, okay, each performer four minutes and then get off stage. We'll give each performer a solid time. So performers have to work on their pieces yeah. to give us a show. And uh, we've given each performer 15 to 20 minutes yeah. as performances. Yeah. And you come, you memorize your piece, you've got music playing, but it's dumbed down and the microphone is jacked up and you listen to the lyrics and yeah, yeah, yeah. that person's delivery. Uh, so yeah, super excited about that actually. Yeah. It's happening on November 2nd. I don't know if this episode will be <laughs> It will be out then. by then. Yeah, hopefully. Or it <laughs> happened on November 2nd. Uh, uh, but yes, I agree with you. Kick it up a notch. These f like three minute, four minute performances are always nice, but kicking it up a notch is definitely no, on but the we cards. We have to understand it's, it's spoken word poetry is trendy now. It is trendy. It's yeah. it's becoming a thing, which is great. It's great, but then anything that becomes trendy imposes uh, a certain form. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's happening because I, I attended... It's a, the it's a comfort zone then. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I attended... I mean, it's like hip-hop can sound the same sometimes, you know. I mean, uh, spoken poetry can... You can always fall into the trap of the comfort zone, of yeah. the thing that's mostly there the most common way of of saying things um yeah and i think it's just good to say these things it's it's there's no harm or shame no, in no. acknowledging that we all fall uh, in a certain trap and it's always good to say okay but what do i want to do uh, what is more you know connected to my story to my family to what i feel and taking it from there and i think this is where we get a more authentic, to use your word, a more authentic art form. Yeah. It's when we st use something as a platform and then we 
يعني بتطلع you go beyond yeah. it evolving it, you evolve basic. yeah بالضبط I listened to an interview or watched rather an interview with uh, your good friend Zayna Hashim Beck yeah. which is also who is also my friend yeah Uh, and uh, I noticed she said something that really uh, struck me. They asked her, do you think that a poet is, uh, do you think that someone is born a poet mm. or is uh, raised mm. to become a poet? And she said like flat out, born a poet, you're either born with it or you're not. And uh, she went to, on to explain, which is an interesting viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what, what are your oh, thoughts that's on... Oh, that's interesting. You can also answer it in another way, such as like, I think I'm born or nurtured to become. I mean, I don't know. I think, I mean, I didn't decide to be a poet. I mean, I don't even, I don't even like calling myself a poet anymore. Mm. It, it's, it's weird, but I, I prefer writer and performer, really. Okay. Now this is my my new comfort title. T- title. I like it. Use it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But Farah Shama, the writer slash performer. Yeah, I even fixed my Wikipedia page. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Now everyone will <laughs> refer to you. I mean, you think that changing these things is easy? It's not. Wikipedia? Oh no, it's not. Really? They need to What's approve. the process? It's. Um, you just send an email. Please change this. No, no. It's um, you go on the page itself and then you edit it on the page. You you like suggest an edit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and true. then it has to be approved because especially if you're editing your own page, uh, it's called like a conflict of interests. Uh-huh. Uh, so they need to make sure what you're, you've written is neutral. And then every sentence you write has to be referenced with another link, like usually newspaper articles or books. They don't take YouTube. YouTube is not an official really? reference. No. Interesting. So you have to reference with a newspaper article mainly or other articles like online articles or books. Okay. Yeah. So it's not that easy. I was actually very happy to see that because someone had written my Wikipedia page years ago, uh, but it was like very short. With it's your out- knowledge or without your knowledge? Uh, without my knowledge. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And it was outdated and it had like... information that yeah. is really not relevant like, like Farah Shama the poet <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> how hell? so not relevant <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah uh, it's writer and performer now <laughs> yeah but you know it, it yeah whatever so I just suggested like an update like what I have been doing I'm no longer a student it says that I'm a student oh, yes. so okay. it was just you know outdated um, I totally forgot what I was saying um, yes so born or, or nurtured yes. um So, yes, I started writing very young, like 12. And even, even in school, I just loved expressing how I felt through words. Even as a young child, uh, I always had that. And when I grew older, I realized it's because my mother mm. expresses herself really well through words. My mother always wrote letters when she was unhappy or happy or mad. She expresses herself very well. through handwritten letters that's a while ago and now it's facebook of course so <laughs> now she just status sends updates. yeah she sends like a you know she writes a big status update and i realize it's in the family uh-huh. and this is a new discovery that i am my mother spoke to us through very fine refined language Mm-hmm. She enjoys expressing herself like that. And I think it's there. And I think both my sister and I somewhat have that ability to express ourselves. Now, when you realize, okay, I am pretty good with words. I feel it. I like how I feel. Uh, it's not about being good. It's just about, okay, I feel like it's, it If makes it, me feel good. Exactly. If it makes you feel good, therefore yourself is motivated to do it more often. Thus... Mm. getting you to a level of skill yeah yeah you and know, then you you start you start doing what you do you know whatever you you want to um, read more poetry you want to understand uh, poetry as a very um, structured art form or had a literary form because yeah we can all go study syllables and uh, the names of different uh, poetry you know forms like i don't know haiku or we can we can study yeah lemur we can go study it um very academically and understand it uh, but then as i said about performance um i'm slowly starting to feel that 
you know, sometimes um, you meet this, you know, I mean, in Brazil, I was in Brazil for five weeks last week and uh, la like, yeah, almost last week. And, you know, I was walking by the beach in the streets and I met this um, this man who sold accessories on the street and he spoke so beautifully mm. and so poetically and I'm not sure he knew that he was that he was speaking like that but that's his way of speaking and that's his way of expressing himself and I think the most poetic things are the things that do not know they're poetic right. and I'm starting to feel that more and more mm -hmm. um, when it's very labeled it it everything that is very labeled loses something because it's so self-aware. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I know I'm a poet and I act like a poet and I speak like a poet, I mean, we all kind of cringe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I think it's it's really about understanding that يعني, you can go, um, when you start listening and hearing people out, you will hear very crazy things. And children, of course. I mean, God, they're just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they say the most, like, if we want to talk about metaphors and imagery, yeah. just listen to children because they are still not, uh, you know, polluted with the structure and they are, you know, the very, again, the refined way of thinking and, you know, the the imposed, like, they, they, they still haven't conformed. Yeah. They don't even understand rules yet. Like, yeah. therefore, they're courageous to yeah, yeah. do whatever. Yeah, they, they're getting to know things. So they're touching things. They're saying things. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think the simplicity is what what is so beautiful. It's like, okay, I want to learn everything about poetry and then hopefully unlearn them, all of them. Right. And unlearn that I'm a poet and unlearn. Uh, it's not easy, but I think... I mean, I've been reading this beautiful... I've, I've been reading two very beautiful poets these days. I've been reading... So an Arabic writer and an English writer. And they're both alive, which I'm very happy. <laughs> they're not like, you know, long gone. Yeah. Um, uh, Stephen Dunn. Oh, yes, you've told and me I've about shared, them. And I've shared yeah. Stephen Dunn with you. And Ibrahim Dawood. And Ibrahim Dawood mainly writes on, on Facebook... And he just sent me all of his uh, books, which is very cute and very lovely. Because I asked him and he, he's based in Egypt and he sent them with, with a friend. And they both have this childlike way of seeing the world. And Mashd Kurdiye, which, you know, who's, a, who's an artist, but he draws yeah. as if he were a child or like as if he yes. were talking to children. But it's very poetic. And it's so... Along with his uh, art, like the yeah. drawings. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is what I miss. Now I feel like, okay, I've done my part in the, you know, uh, angry teenager who's angry at society and angry because Palestine, um, you know, is occupied and is angry and I'm blaming society for things. And I think now I'm a bit bored of myself uh, being in that chair, you know, mm -hmm. um, judging and looking and, you know, changing the world uh, <laughs> with my poetry. Now I feel like it's time to play. Okay. It's time to just describe what is around me, really. Mm -hmm. Just describe what is around you because, yes, it is a bit... It's, it's very easy to be angry at the world. And so many rappers are angry at the world and so many poets are angry at the world. And I don't know, I think it's, it's good to mix at least. Right. Uh, it's good to sometimes just go like, okay, I am not on social media. I cannot just press a button and then, you know, thousands of people will read what I said. Mm -hmm. And then just look around you and say, I would like to write about what I'm actually going through right now. Like what I'm actually, what is actually surrounding me. Mm -hmm. And if that happens to be, you know, injustice you, or yeah. ang go for it. But sitting in your comfortable house, wherever, and then being very angry about, you know, what is happening somewhere far away mm -hmm. can be great. But man, it's not that real. You know, it, you're not living that. Yeah. And I would always rather, you know, be told a story 
when I sit with someone, be told the story that 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 person went through or is going through than a secondhand story. Of course. So much so that uh, on Hamburger Generation, the other <laughs> podcast that I run, we do not allow secondhand stories. Exactly. <laughs> and it's and it's always and that that's enough, you know. And yeah. I mean, let's let's look at spoken word poetry. Uh, let's go online and and go through it and see how some of it is very you know feels more authentic, feels more personal, and others just feel like okay, it's a discussion, it's a topic, it's a political topic. Both are valid. Yeah. But I'm just saying right now. I mean, my first poems were just anger at the way the world is working. You know, like okay. my poem Ashisha, which I hate. I hate this poem. Uh, I don't know. I, I never really liked it. I never listened to it. And I'm like, what was I doing? You know, sitting there. You were sitting at a shisha cafe. And a shisha cafe <laughs> and saying, oh my God, how horrible. You know, um, the Arab. <laughs> Basically, you were saying, hashtag.com, <laughs> hashtag shisha. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, looking back now, I go, like, what is this? Uh-huh. What is this judgmental teenager saying? And then I'm like, sure, okay. It's there. Deleting it is not, I mean, I thought of it, but then I'm like, no, mm. move forward, you know, learn, grow. No wonder I was Farah Shamma, the poet. Yeah, see, I'm no longer the poet now. <laughs> I'm the brighter and performer. And then if we have a podcast in five years, I'll be like, oh, I no longer call myself a writer and performer. <laughs> I'm an astronaut now, you know? <laughs> so yeah, we'll see. Until... Uh until next year then yeah five years <laughs> <laughs> if let's say i mean i don't know if you like this question but let's say the ears of every single writer and performer mm. who is uh, looking up to you mm. this listening right now what would you tell them in mm. an advice form or otherwise if you want if it feels good do it and mm. if it doesn't you know, it doesn't really matter. I don't think that's very good advice, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at that because I really... Yeah, I guess it's a bit too general, right? It's like, it's too general. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, I'm, I'm again, I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm an advice giver or I am, mm. again, the shisha person sitting there and pointing out, you know. Right. But I think... But I can imagine a lot of people do look up to you as a performer. I, I like, mean, mm, I think I it's... Like yeah, I think, doing it I think I'm very it. happy with with the Arabic work I'm doing, really. I feel it's it's it fills a gap. Uh, and I think not just because of the content. I think it's because of the the place we're in. I think if, if, we're talk- if I'm talking to the Arabic speakers who, you know, who, who listen to my Arabic work and who think it's important... I'm very happy because I do feel it's important. And I feel that, yes, if you are writing and you can write in Arabic, please do it. Mm -hmm. Because we need more Arabic writers in the world now. We need uh, more people who do not have an inferiority complex and feel that English is cool um, and Arabic is not. Uh, And it's great to write and feel like that whatever you're writing is making a difference or it's matters it more. Fi- it fills a gap yeah. and that's what I say I say there's a gap it's filling there's a gap that is you know and that's why I love Arabic rap I love Arabic rap because it it's so nice to hear you know this this genre of music that is widespread that is everywhere in the world almost uh, and, and it's culturally heavy like exactly and it's there it has a scene um, and I think the poetry and the hip hop scenes do merge somewhere. Flowetry, uh, come November second, and, and then November second, <laughs> you have that. You have hip hop and poetry, and I think it's it's really about that. And so, okay, let's say if you know, I I look at my YouTube channel and I feel like Jinsia, okay, Fa'uminu, okay, we have two poems that have been the most heard. I also feel like. I need to give a chance and I hope, you know, od- the audiences that, that listen to my work give a chance to the new things as well. Okay. Because it's not always going to be Kaifu Minu and Al Jinsiya and Qadaya, big causes. I think yeah. we just like everyone feels like sharing stories, I would like to share stories and I would like to do performances that are not 
mm. you know that are more personal I would, s- I would say like don't like as viewers i think may correct me if you're if i'm wrong but as viewers you're telling them don't fall in love with the persona that i'm put that uh, that is out there on youtube fall in love with the person which is me who is evolving and changing throughout and i life. think i mean because i i do I post other work, right? Yeah. I uh, I've recently shared uh, the the London performances, and they never get the same love or attention. And I wonder why. Is it because they are more personal? Is it because they are more experimental? Is poetry in the Arab world always? Does it always have to be a certain thing? Uh, you know. And when I wrote Min al Yamini al Shimal, I knew it was going to be a hit. <laughs> yeah. And it's like. <laughs> It's great, yeah, yeah. but also I think we need some change. And it's just, it takes us back to the conversation about Arabic. Arabic doesn't always have to be fusha, and it doesn't always have to be a very serious topic. And Mama uh, Kifil Magister is just a fun way of mixing English, Arabic, Amiye, Mahkiye, and fusha. Right. I agree. Yeah, and I, I really love that piece because yeah. that was really me speaking to the audience and saying, hey, we are all these things. We, we, most of us are bilingual. Most of us speak English or are learning English or you know, aspire to speak English. It's the world <laughs> right now. So I yeah. think, yeah, I think it's, it's giving a chance to new uh, art forms. And if you are, you know, you, you look up to me, as you say, because you write, yeah, don't, don't be afraid of experimenting. I mean, play, play and see what, what comes out. Good advice. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's really the f- the fear of just getting stuck, because I feel stuck. هاي اللي بتحكي عن الفصحى اللغة العربية الفصحى واللي بتحكي عن فلسطين وهيك بس خلص خلصت. فدا and دائما هيك بحس إنه I've been just خلص boxed into two three ideas. Okay. وخلص. So I think no one wants to be boxed, and I'm trying to get out, and hopefully it works. Don't just think outside the box. Get out of it. Get out of it, yeah, <laughs> completely. Tell us, finally, wh- what you have going on in your life now. What's your next step? Um, and, I'm uh, going to be... Future plans. I'm working on a piece with a dancer in Belgium right okay. now, in Brussels, for the next couple of months. And I am working with a beautiful singer who I will not expose right away. Uh, but hopefully when our work is, um, you know, when we decide to share our work, you'll know who she is. It's a she. And that's that's where I am right now. It's project by project. I'm based in London for now, but will be coming to the UAE, to the Emirates Airlines Festival of Literature in February. Exciting. So, yeah. So if you're around, it'll be also good to see you at the festival. And yes. And I, uh, I guess I can announce this, but I think uh, we're we're in talks, and it looks like the poetry hood, Al Hay Shari, mm. will be involved this year at the Emirates Literature Festival, which yeah. is very exciting uh, for me. Definitely, yeah. super super excited about that. There's going to be international poets that they're flying in from around the world. Yeah, should be should be good stuff. Yes. I, n- I never know how to end these, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I never know how to start them and I never know how to end them. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for coming to our studio and uh, for hey. this wonderful conversation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye.